EMT level care is as effective as paramedic level care in reducing mortality. This is a surprising statement. And today we're gonna to discuss the research that supports the statement and the challenges and the opportunities that it presents. We're talking about calls within the 911 system and we're talking about urban suburban EMS systems, not rural and um, frontier systems. If we look at the common modern urban EMS system, uh, one of the most prominent models is first response ALS on fire trucks that are equipped with one to three paramedics on board. And then an ALS ambulance transport unit that is also ALS has one to two paramedics on board. That transport unit might be part of the fire department. It might be a private company, a third service, hospital based. Um, that doesn't really change what we found in this research. First thing I like to ask is how many calls are BLS? And when we look at that, we found that most providers say that 50% or more of their calls do not require paramedic drugs or procedures. So more than half of our calls are BLS. So why do we have all ALS systems when so many calls are BLS? And the reason has always been because ALS is better. I think it's the overwhelming opinion of EMS providers in our industry that ALS is far superior to BLS and that there's a risk in sending a BLS truck to a call that may need ALS. It's a risk to the patient's life and it's a risk to us from a liability perspective. And it seems like we kind of all believe that. But is ALS better? If we look at evidence-based medicine, we get some real surprises. The evidence collected over the past quarter of a century shows no advantage in mortality reduction from paramedic ALS care over EMT BLS care in the urban and suburban setting. I've put on this page a large number of studies that I've looked at. Some of these are meta-analysis that support this claim. There's many more. This is a fraction of those studies. What I could not find while researching this were any studies that showed a pure dominant um, in, uh, improvement in care or reduction in mortality of paramedic level care, ALS, over EMT level care, BLS. If you have access to studies like that, I'd love to see them. Um, but I seriously could not find a single study that showed that ALS is superior to BLS. There's a large number of studies that show BLS and ALS are basically equivalent. Some of the studies might be a little flawed. You might look at them and say, well, this one's not good because of this or this one's not great because of that. But when you look at all these together and they all point in the same direction, we have to believe that there's some weight to these studies and there's some truth in what they're saying. I'm not saying that's comfortable. It's very difficult for me as a career paramedic, and I'm sure it's difficult for many of you, but we've got to look at it and, and look at the science and see what, um, what it means to us. Let me just read a few statements out of some of these um, studies give you an idea of um, what we're dealing with here. One statement was advanced life support did not improve survival in out of hospital cardiac arrest. Others have said in cardiac arrest, early CPR and defibrillation are essential for survival, but pre-hospital ALS interventions have not improved survival. In trauma, they found that ALS and IV, flu IV fluids and innovation did not improve survival to discharge. And that in a meta-analysis, studies failed to demonstrate a benefit of on-site ALS provided to trauma. 
Um, the majority of research into trauma favors BLS. Some in trauma, some of the care provided by paramedics, like intubation without anesthesia, can actually be harmful. Survival to 90 days among patients with trauma, stroke, and respiratory failure were higher with BLS than ALS. And ALS is associated with substantially higher mortality for several acute medical emergencies than BLS. Now, these aren't summaries of the entire research base. These are summaries from meta-analysis or individual studies that I'm reading to you. But overwhelmingly, it doesn't look real positive for paramedic level care. There are a couple things that were positive. One study showed um, in respiratory distress, ALS had better outcomes by a little bit less than 2%. And in another one, it showed that patients with AMI had better survival to 90 days with ALS by 1%. Other studies showed different things, lesser. But I think overall, when you look at these studies, you'd have to say that ALS and BLS pretty much wash out. They're pretty much equal as far as mortality goes. Well, how is this possible? I had to really think that through. This is not what I expected to find. I expected to find that ALS, uh, maybe I'm optimistic, but I expected to find that ALS was going to be, I don't know, 10% or better in reducing mortality than EMT level care. I mean, look at all the things that we do in ALS and they don't seem to be reducing mortality. So that how is this possible? So let's look at a few things and it might shed some light on why this is probably true. One thing is EMT is not so basic anymore. If you look at the things that EMTs can do now that used to be only part of the paramedic domain, there's a lot of things we've given over to the EMTs that are really effective at saving lives. So number one being the AED. EMTs can defibrillate. So can the general public. Um, that's um, uh, a huge life-saving thing. Defibrillations and good CPR are the most effective things in resuscitation. And EMTs can do that. You don't need paramedics for that. Um, they can do CPAP. They can do 12 lead EKG and give aspirin to chest pain patients, which are the most effective things for, um, for care for STEMI. Um, they don't read the EKG, but they can transmit it for it to be read and a trauma, a, a STEMI alert made by the hospital. Uh, they can give Narcan, which is very effective. They can give Epi um, by auto injector and nebulized mans and other things that are all are good. And we, we shouldn't take that away from them. I mean, these are all good progressive things to come along, but that definitely tilts um, the scale toward the EMT and away from the paramedic a little bit as far as mortality reduction goes. The other thing is the advent of definitive care. I started an EMS many, many years ago. And back in the 80s, early 80s, there was no treatment for an acute MI. If you had a clot in your coronary artery, you had a clot in your coronary artery. The hospital couldn't take that out. So we treated the complications of MI, dysrhythmias, congestive failure, cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest. But we couldn't get rid of that clot. Well, that's changed a lot now with um, fibrinolytic therapy and PCI. If you're having a heart attack and get them to the hospital, they can get rid of the clot and get rid of that acute MI. Um, and so the thing we have to do is get them to the hospital. It's kind of taken away a lot of our thunder and shifted it to the hospital. And it makes transportation way more important than the ALS kind of care that we, that we do. Um, same for stroke care. I mean, if you get them to the hospital, they can get rid of the clot. And trauma centers have definitely it definitely changed um, mortality for um, pre-hospital trauma. All those require us to recognize the emergency and getting get the patient to the to the appropriate facility. That can be done by EMTs in an urban and suburban environment. Brings us to mind that the primary function of pre-hospital EMS is to get a patient to the hospital. And that's becoming more and more prevalent as time goes on. We need to focus our efforts 
on making sure we have an adequate number of transport units and not necessarily focusing our efforts on having paramedics on every corner. Speaking of paramedics on every corner, it's quite possible that we have too many paramedics in this system and that's affecting the quality of care that the paramedics can provide. The first thing that comes to mind with that is the lack of oversight by medical direction due to too many paramedics in this system. Remember paramedic means beside the doctor. And when paramedics were first developed, the idea was they would work really close with the physician, with the medical director, and they'd have one-to-one -one discussions about calls. And the medical director was going to watch closely what these paramedics did out in the field, because this was a new concept, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So it was a very close relationship between medical directors and paramedics. But as we got more and more paramedics, that relationship has deteriorated. If a medical director has 200 paramedics in his system, it's not likely that he has many one-on-one -on -one conversations with those paramedics or is able to review any decent percent of the critical calls that those paramedics have. In addition to that, the more paramedics you have, the more expensive and the more difficult it is to train them. So um, large numbers of paramedics have probably uh, helped reduce the quality of the paramedic. In addition to the training and medical direction, a lack of opportunity to perform their skills has probably affected that as well. If there's only a certain number of innovations available in that system that need to be done, the more paramedics you have, the less likely they are to get to perform that skill. And so skill deterioration is, is a problem when you have a saturation of paramedics. Now, it's not just innovation. Innovation is a good example of that. But that's for any of your advanced life support skills, um, whether it's differential diagnosis of CHF versus pneumonia or putting a, a needle thoracotomy in or doing an RSI um, or reading a 12 lead EKG. All those skills need regular practice to um, keep up your skills, to keep up your skill level. Um, if you don't uh, use it, you lose it is what they say. Right. And that's probably what's happening or could be what's happening to our level of care in paramedic systems. A good example of that was a study done back in 2001 by Katz and Falk in um, Central Florida. They took 108 consecutive intubated patients. They had a system set up where they could check the tube placement exactly and precisely when the patient arrived at the hospital. When they did that, they found out that 27 of those 108 patients had misplaced tubes. The worst of those, 18 of them, the tube was in the esophagus. Now, I'm not talking about you put a tube in the esophagus, realized it was in the wrong place and pulled it out. I'm talking about they put the tube in the esophagus and the paramedic brought the patient into the hospital thinking the tube was properly placed and was continuing to ventilate or oxygenate the patient through that misplaced tube. That's a fatal error. OK, it's almost always a fatal error. 18 of 108, that's like 16 percent or something. That's really bad. Um, from this study, what emerged was that uh, end tidal CO2 was great. We need to get end tidal CO2 to everybody to help them innovate um, and help them check their tube placement. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with end tidal CO2 monitoring. That's good. But what the study missed and it was talked about a lot during the study and right after, but it seems to me it got swept under the rug. The paramedics were saying, we don't get an opportunity to innovate very often. This system has, is a tip, it was a typical urban system, just like they are today. They have several paramedics, two or more sometimes on an engine. They have paramedics running around in rescue trucks that don't transport. There's one or two paramedics on there. And then a private provider or hospital-based provider with one or two paramedics on it. And it was not unusual in this system to have four, five, six paramedics on the scene. They also have, um, you know, supervisors, captains, whatever, um, battalion commanders that are also um, paramedics. So there's tons of paramedics in this system. And I think that helped contribute to them not being able to do their job well. It dilutes the skill, um, the skill opportunities. This more recent study 
in 2022 is very enlightening in that same thought processes. If you if you want to look at too many paramedics, they compared flight crew members to ground crew providers. And they said, who has the higher innovation success rate? And they found that flight crew members had 95% success rate is over a number of different flight crews. And they looked at a number of different ground ambulance providers. They had an average of 76% success rate. Interestingly enough, that 76% is about the same success rate we had way back in 2001 with the Falk study, right? We haven't improved. End tidal CO2 did not solve our problem. There's still a problem with ground crews innovating. Now, why would the flight crew members, their paramedics, be so much better than the ground crew paramedics? Well, everybody knows that when you get a job on a flight crew and you put the flight crew jumpsuit on and zip it up, you automatically can innovate very well. Oh, wait, no, that's not it, is it? The difference is, and the, the study cited, that the flight crews had more opportunity to innovate and they had increased clinical education. Now, how do you get more opportunities to innovate and increased clinical education to ground paramedics? The only way to do that is to reduce their numbers. And it's safe to reduce their numbers if we can show that they're not reducing mortality any better than EMTs. We can reduce the number of paramedics in the system safely, and we can improve their level of care. So, if most 911 calls only require BLS, paramedic care does not improve mortality, and there's too many paramedics in the system creating a lower ALS quality, why not convert 50 to 75% of the paramedics in the system to EMTs? That could improve patient outcome, improve employee satisfaction, and improve efficiency. I know it sounds a little crazy, but think about it for a minute. How would it improve patient outcome? Well, we know from science that EMTs and paramedics have about the same mortality outcome. But if we reduce the number of paramedics, improve their training, and improve their opportunity to do skills, they could get as good as those flight paramedics, right? And that might reduce mortality if their skill level was better. And I don't mean just innovation. All their skill levels could improve. A smaller number of paramedics can be better trained, have more direct contact with a medical director, and have more opportunity to perform their critical skills. So that could actually improve patient outcome. And it certainly wouldn't decrease patient outcome because we know from science that EMTs and paramedics have basically the same um, mortality uh, output. Now, it could also improve employee satisfaction because one of the things you see paramedics complain about is that, gee, I went to school for, I learned all these advanced skills and I don't get to use them. 50% of the calls they go on are BLS calls. And when they arrive at a call that's ALS, They've got at least one, maybe as many as four other paramedics to compete with for those skills. So they're clearly dissatisfied. They're not getting a chance to use the skills they've learned. This is the same for EMTs in these systems. They go to EMT school and they learn all these life-saving skills that are truly life-saving. Opening airways, controlling bleeding, doing CPR, defibrillating with an AED. They love that they learn all that stuff in school and do very well with it. But then what do we do when we put them on the ambulance? What do they do? They drive the ambulance. They drive the fire truck. They don't get to take care of patients. So they're dissatisfied. I think going to this type of system, if we did it right, would improve employee satisfaction and longevity and would work real well for us. And it would improve efficiency. Um, the simplest thing to look at there is the pay difference. According to the federal government, EMTs make 33% less than paramedics. I don't think it's that much of a gap. I think it's somewhere between 5 and 33%.
But if you can reduce your payroll of your paramedics by about even 10 to 15 percent, um, that's going to be a big savings. And that money could be used to put more transport units on the road, reduce the workload, and would not negatively affect patient outcome. Uh, the other, um, there's a ton of other efficiencies that are smaller, but like it costs less to train an EMT than a paramedic. Their continuing education is cheaper. The amount of equipment and supplies and drugs they need for their truck is less. So you're going to save some money there. And also we end up throwing away because medications get expired. When we have too many paramedics and too many drug boxes in the system, a lot of medicines go unused and they get expired and they get thrown in the landfill. And that's a terrible waste as well. This is what a system might look like. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but here's one way to do it. You could um, make a system that's EMT centered. Uh, the first thing you'll notice about the system, one of the biggest changes and probably at on the surface won't be popular, but if you think about it, it makes sense. And that is look in the upper left hand corner. There is no ALS first response. First response is going to be done at a BLS level. Um, if ALS doesn't save lives over EMT level care, it's, it's kind of hard to justify vehicles that don't transport that are ALS. It's really hard to justify that at all. So in this system, there would be no ALS first response. The fire department would still respond in a first response capacity, but at the EMT level. Ambulances, pretty much the same way. The majority of the ambulances would be EMT ambulances. They wouldn't be paramedics anymore. Most calls are EMT calls, and most calls could be handled by EMT ambulances. You'd still have paramedic ground ambulances, and we'll talk about why as we go on. But you're still going to have paramedic ground ambulances. It's just not they're going to roll on every call. They're going to roll on a very specific list from the 911 call center, only to where they really, truly need to be. And think about that with the research. For example, that's not critical trauma. Right. There's not a lot of things that have to be ALS just because the patient's sick. There's certain things that would require paramedics, but not most things. So paramedics would almost become more like air ambulances. They're going to be sent when they're really needed and called when they're really needed. When the first response EMTs get on the scene and realize they need something that's a true emergency that a paramedic's needed, they would call for it. EMT ambulance arrives on the scene. Um, the patient is terribly unstable, then they can call uh, for a paramedic ground ambulance if they need the assistance. And that's kind of the way it would work. The EMTs would have a lot of responsibility. They'd be very good EMTs because they'd be handling this and have a lot of responsibility and they'd be doing the job on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything else in the system seems pretty much the same. You still have fire department rescue, law enforcement, air ambulances, utility companies, things like that. But the main thrust would most patients would get to the hospital in a BLS ambulance and um, paramedics would be a supplement to that. Now, uh, paramedics aren't bad. Paramedics are part of the EMS system. Um, most of the skills they perform are EMT skills. And apparently most of the skills they perform that save lives are EMT skills. Um, most paramedics are hardworking, dedicated individuals. And very importantly, not everything paramedics do reduce mortality, but are still good things. Let's take a look at some of those. Paramedic actions that are not mortality related include relief of pain, relief of nausea, sedation for psychiatric emergencies, and conversion of stable tachycardias like AFib, RVR, and PSVT, and other things. When you look at this, it's kind of interesting to say that EMTs save lives and paramedics make patients more comfortable. And, and it's in the current system that we're in, that's probably, um, probably true. And so we should not eliminate all the paramedics. We should reduce the size of the flock, improve their educational opportunities, improve their contact with medical direction, and monitor how much progress we're making so that we can bring a re the, our expected reduction in mortality back to the paramedics. 
As an industry, EMS should embrace the research. We've got to accept this, guys. I mean, show me if I'm wrong. Show me studies that say paramedics save lives way more than EMTs. But you've seen the huge body of evidence out there that shows the opposite. I think it's going to stand. Um, we need to accept that. Do you remember back when... Um, if you didn't immobilize somebody's spine when they had a head injury, that that was a really terrible thing. If you didn't put them on a long backboard, strap them with a C collar and head blocks and wrap them to the board a special way and take them to the hospital, you know, that that had to be done for anybody that had a suspected spine injury. And there were multi-million dollar lawsuits over paramedics and EMTs that didn't spinal mobilize somebody and ended up paralyzed. And we were blamed for it. Well, now we know better. We know that spinal immobilization doesn't really reduce um, uh, uh, paralysis. So we've changed the way we think. Our industry changed that. We looked at it and said, gee, that's just not true. The research shows us that backboards aren't good. Okay, long, you know, uh, spinal immobilization in that way is not good. So we change and we have to change the same way here. Um, Sending a BLS call to a uh, BLS ambulance to an emergency call, it's not a death sentence. It's not wrong. It's actually the right thing to do. We need to make the appropriate changes. I'd like to see some progressive departments come out and say, I'm reducing the number of ALS ambulance in my transport service. I'm eliminating ALS from my first response because I want to be more efficient. I want to be more effective. And then we need to reevaluate this after the changes are made, which we should always do. And we tend to fail. We, we tend not to do that. But we need to reevaluate as we go. That's how we've got ourselves in the position where 25 years of research shows that we're not doing a good job. And we haven't done much about that. We need to determine the correct role, volume, and education levels for paramedics. How many paramedics do we really need? What's their correct role? What's the correct education level? We need to start considering these things. Now, I'm not saying that there's not paramedics out there that are really good and are probably reducing mortality in their individual practice. Um, that may well be true. There may be some high performance systems that are reducing mortality because their medical director and their paramedics are really intense at doing certain things that are reducing mortality. I'm not saying that does not exist, but as an overall thing across the nation, we're not making a difference as paramedics. Okay, so, you know, understand it from that perspective. Now let's look at EMT versus paramedic. EMT's vocational training, one or two semesters in an EM, EMT program, and you'll learn the skills that are listed there. There's no reading in, of an EKG, even basic dysrhythmia or complex 12-lead electrocardiography. There's no dosage calculation in the algebra that goes along with that. Um, there's no real harsh differential diagnosis of complex medical conditions. It's pretty much straightforward. The drugs they give, the procedures they do are pretty straightforward. I know the symptoms of anaphylaxis. If somebody has that, I hit them with an EpiPen. I know if someone's unresponsive and I suspect narcotic overdose, I hit them with um, Narcan. I don't have to measure it. I don't have to calculate it. I can just do it. It's pretty straightforward. And if you look at the things an EMT can do now, it's actually a pretty good job. If you were allowed to run emergency calls in an urban, suburban setting with this um, set of skills, you could really do a good job. I, mean, I think they could really do a wonderful job and it would be a rewarding job. There's a few things we might want to look at adding to EMTs if we move toward this type of system. One is the uh, something called hypopen or it's glucagon in a pre-filled syringe, basically um, glucagon in an EpiPen if you want to. So if somebody's um, sugar is low, you hit them with a hypopen. People use them at home. They give them to diabetics to use at home. It's certainly something an EMT could handle. Um, a buccal Zofran would be good. You can just take a little film of Zofran, stick it on the inside of the, of the mouth. And that way you don't have to call an ALS unit just to manage nausea. Uh, you wouldn't have to call an ALS unit to, to manage hypoglycemia. The EMT could do that with a, a glucagon prefill. 
Um, and, and another thing, and, and this is kind of a far off shot, but I even think that you could do a premix of IV analgesics something equivalent maybe to four milligrams of morphine, whether that's fentanyl or morphine, whatever, but equivalent around four milligrams of morphine in a pre-mixed IM. And if somebody's vital signs were stable and the criteria was met and they had a great deal of pain, you could hit them with an IM shot one time on the way to the hospital and start reducing their pain. I, I think that's valid. I think that would work. I know there's it's complicated because it's narcotics and I don't know how that would work, but um, it's something to think about. I mean, you don't really want to be pulling ALS units just for pain management, but something to think about. Now, look at what paramedics do. And we've already we've always vocationally trained them for the most part. We haven't had a lot of requirement for professional training. And I'm a vocationally trained paramedic. And I always thought I did a pretty good job. But when I look at what we do, it's really not ridiculous to start thinking about maybe we need to improve the level of training for paramedics and i mean the the basic education level to enter the the field um i'd like to see us kind of do a thing where we're doing we're training some vocationally we're training some at the pa and nurse practitioner level specific for pre-hospital work emergency work and we're also using physicians in some areas on ambulances, emergency physicians, and compare the outcome of those three. Um, we might find that no matter who's doing it, that these sort of skills in the urban and suburban setting, that that 20 minutes that we have the patient, 20, 30 minutes that we have the patient, isn't really, these skills aren't gonna make much of a difference. That might be what we find. Or we might find that if we put a properly trained person in there with these skills, that we can really make a mortality difference. We need to look at that. We got to, you know, we can't just keep taking tax money and not providing a product that works. So we have to really look at this and um, uh, put ourselves to the task. And I know this is not comfortable. This is not where we think we're going. And people worry about, oh, what about the new stuff on the horizon? We've got blood, we've got ketamine for seizures, we've got, um, the head elevated CPR, you know, the really intense CPR, all, all that's fine. There still be paramedics in this system. We can still do those things. And if they work, then we can change our protocols to match that in this system. Um, but we have to know that they work before we can put that in place. It's crazy to go give blood to every paramedic in the country when we know that the ALS stuff we're doing now doesn't really seem to work. Um, uh, we really have to adjust this before we start adding too many more things. But certainly this system doesn't preclude any of that on the cusp new training coming along or new skills coming along from happening. It does not prevent that at all. Yeah, I suggest you read these articles of interest. Um, these are uh, four or five articles here that are really good. They don't all agree with what I'm saying exactly, but they give you good insight as to what I'm talking about and some different opinions on it. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to look at this. Make comments below. Please don't hate me for saying paramedics aren't saving lives. I don't like to hear that. I did not make it up. It's in tons of research. I'm only presenting the information. I think we should look at it as an opportunity to improve EMS, and I think it's time that we do that. So thank you again. Make your comments below. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say.